On today's show, we're bringing on a colleague, friend, and fellow Ontarian from the math education world. He's an author of Pie of Life and his soon-to-be-released book, Math Recess. He's an international keynote speaker and a part of the Buzz Math team. This is episode 14, Pie of Life, an interview with Sunil Singh. We talk about the simplicity of mathematics, how learning mathematics should be more like the preparation of a fantastic meal rather than just serving up the final finished dish. And finally, Sunil gives us some suggestions on how we can teach effectively. Hit that wonderful intro music. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. We are two math teachers who, together, with you, the community of educators worldwide who want to build and deliver math lessons that spark engagement, fuel learning, and ignite teacher action. Are you ready for this episode number 14, John? Of course. This was such a pleasant conversation with Sunil. His love of math is so clear and present. We definitely could pull that from this episode. Uh, you can also tell how much he cares about how math should be taught to our children. That's right. Before we get to the interview, one of our favorite books that both John and I read this year and we reference later in this episode is The Coaching Habit by Michael Bungay Stanier. And believe it or not, both John and I actually listen to that book in audio format while driving, running, or just relaxing. And now you can to for free because Amazon's Audible platform is offering you two free books by going to makemathmoments.com forward slash free book. That's makemathmoments.com forward slash free book. If you like podcasts, then two free audiobooks with Audible is the way to go. Without further ado, here's our chat with Sunil. Hey there, Sunil. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. We're so excited to have you with us tonight. How are you doing? I am doing excellent. Uh, it's a bit cold out right here right now, but feeling a bit warmed up talking to you guys. Awesome, awesome stuff. Yeah, like it's definitely cold. And if uh, you're listening to this at the time of this recording, we're having some of our worst winter weather here in Ontario. We just shut down our school boards almost across the province. Um, Except here in Windsor. In Windsor, we never shut down. <laughs> That's true. You guys' boards stayed open and I got to work today and didn't hear that the schools were closed. This buses were canceled. I still went and then I walked in the door and the principal was waiting there going, okay, yeah, the schools are now closed as of like 10 minutes ago. So that was great. And I just turned around and went home. But uh, I, <laughs> yeah, so it was a day around the house with everybody at home today, the whole family. So yeah, let's dive into a talk to you tonight. Could you maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself and our listeners? Like, who are you? I've met you a number of times at math conferences, but I'm curious, like fill us in on your backstory. What has been your mathematical journey? Well, I'm glad you sort of punctuated your question mark with journey because I was going to give you an abbreviated sort of response to the question, but I know that we have an hour and I wouldn't have given this answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't or have given, longer. Or longer. I probably would not have given this answer in a 20 minute or 30 minute podcast, but I think it's going to flesh out some oh, of I'm the excited then. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. See, now I've built it up, right? Um, <laughs> right. It, it's going to flesh out some questions, which I think you're going to ask me anyways, but um, here we go. So in 1992, I graduated from Teachers College, but at the time, it was one of the worst years to graduate because for the next three years, there would be very few jobs. And so I did a lot of sort of odds and sod kind of things in terms of working at day camps and tutoring. And then uh, 1994, Labor Day weekend, I still remember this because I was packing up my car. I get a phone call just as I think I'm doing the second last load from a guy I went to Teachers College with and he Goes, look, I'm working at Seneca College. We have an opening for math and physics. Would you like to interest in the job? And I go, when does the job start? He goes, Tuesday. Uh, when do I have to come and interview? He goes, right now. I go, I've got my shorts on. I'm going camping. So my whole life is like been sliding doors, you know, that Gwyneth Paltrow moved from 1998. And I said, okay, I'll come in. Anyways, I got the job. And so I taught math and physics for three years at Seneca College. And then finally, I got my first high school teaching job in 1997. And my first teaching just, uh, you know, gig, I was teaching gifted physics to grade 12 kids, which I wouldn't have been able to do if I didn't have this job where I learned to teach physics. And then about seven years later, you know, 
if you're getting kind of the seven year itch and you want to do something different. So I applied to teach internationally and I went to this website called Search Associates and I started typing in all my information, but it was like 10 pages. And I only filled out the first three saying on math and physics, I gave them my particulars and I left it at that. So here's another. Take it or leave it. That'll be enough. (laughs) That'll be enough. So as I was leaving Friday from the school I was teaching at, normally I would leave early, but I left late and I get a phone call from one of the secretaries saying, look, uh, there's someone on the phone from Search Associates. And he said he found my half finished mangled application online. But because I'm math and physics, he'll take me to the fair. That's where I got a job to go to Switzerland. And I took uh, time, my wife, and that's where she got pregnant with our first son because we had tried for seven years and we couldn't have a child. So there was another sliding doors moment. And I eventually finished my career at uh, the Durham District School Board, which is uh, one of the larger ones, not as big as Toronto District School Board. But in 2012, I quit and I listened to my gut. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew exactly what I didn't want to do more, which was teach at that time, which I thought was a sort of sterile curriculum and very sort of, you know, I couldn't do it in a way which was really resonating with where I thought math should be taught. So I set up this thing called the right angle, which I don't know if you or Kyle know about, but I had planned to open this 5,000 square foot first math store school in Canada. And we actually had a partnership with Queen's University. They were going to send some students for alternate placement there. We had a bus trip planned from Ottawa. Two weeks before grand opening in March 2014, there was a fire. And I lost everything. I remember hearing about that on social media. That was tragic to hear. I I don't talk about it because it's something challenging to talk about. But at the time, I had a gut feeling this was going to be a gift. And, you know, when you start to see the world through impoverished lens, you tend to have a lot of gratitude, friends, family, and even things like mathematics in terms of how much joy it brought you. And hence, it gave birth to the book Pie of Life in terms of you know, seeing mathematics through a a lens where you don't have too much. So that is kind of, (laughs) in a quasi nutshell, a little bit about my sort of, you know, teaching background. Thank you so much for sharing. You know, I remember hearing some of the Twitter conversations. Back in 2014, I knew of you, and I think I was following you at the time, but I don't know if we had met by then. So it was kind of like before we had sort of bumped into each other on the conference trail or whatever. But I do remember some conversations about that. And uh, oh boy, what a loss, you know, because just to have that in Canada and Toronto, you know, only a few hours away from John and I to offer students just something different. I'm wondering if we can maybe roll back to maybe that last part of your career, because when you left your job, initially you said you left, and then after you did come out and say you quit. I know this, but I'm wondering for those listening, can you describe a little more what exactly, I know you mentioned the sterile curriculum and things haven't changed, at least here in Ontario. I really don't think they've changed in a lot of places, to be honest. So can you maybe go into that a little further? Like what was really so challenging for you in the classroom that made you say, you know what, I'm done? It was actually uh, that sort of proverbial last straw on the camel's back. And uh, it's a very specific moment where it happened after lunch during my first class after lunch. And my first class after lunch was a grade 11 applied class. And at that time, in that year, at 2012, 2013, I keep forgetting, they were doing this program, for a PD professional development for teachers who were teaching this specific cohort of kids. And they're meeting once a month. But as you probably know, you know, when you leave the classroom, you got to leave material for the supply teachers. And ironically, how I was trying to help my kids with doing all this PD, I was missing so much class time with them that they were actually falling behind and, you know, those class behavior issues. And I just said to myself, I go, I can't do any more of this because I need to be with my kids. And the last professional development was actually held in my home school and I didn't go to it. And the principal knocked on my door and just said, Sneel, aren't you supposed to be in the library right now? I go, sorry, you know, I, I can't go there. I got my kids. And, you know, I was being kind of, you know, I, I think he could see the emotion on me. And I, he just said, okay, well, just make sure you see me tomorrow morning. And I knew I was going to get reprimanded. And even before I went back to the board to put the chalk on the chalkboard, I knew I quit. I've always listened to my gut for everything in my life. And I go, okay, I'm going to have to honor what this means. And so, you know, I I wrote a seven page resignation letter. And really, it was just about, I felt that the idea of helping kids, and it's great to do all this stuff. But 
you know, relationships and knowing the kids and knowing the stuff that they're going through. I have a lot of kids who came from socioeconomic challenging backgrounds. I didn't feel like that was part of the information that was used to temper how you teach kids. So this frustration just built up at that point. And it's funny because him and I have a great relationship now. And I thank him almost like every time I send him an email or whatever. I say, you know, if it wasn't for you doing your job, I would not be where I am today. So again, it's one of those sliding door moments and I you know, haven't looked back. Hmm, yeah, that trade-off, you know, like I always think about that every single time we have PD in our district too. It's how can we use that professional development time or even resources like money, like release time to actually work with the kids in front of us. You know, the talk that we always get is that we're working for more kids than just the kids in front of us, which I get, but I do want to work with those kids in front of me. And one in actually, I'm just going to go down this path just for a little bit. But one time we had that stance, we just said, no, we're not going to leave the classroom with this release money. And what we ended up doing on this one semester, we ended up bringing supply teachers in to co-teach with us, which gave us more bodies in the room to work with the kids in front of us. So we'd have small group instruction and we trained these supply teachers on how to do what we were doing in the classroom too. So you know, I totally relate to that. That's always a big struggle for us when we're dealing with PD and the kids in front of us and wanting to help those individuals and, the, you know, the relationships that we were building with our kids. And I know that's a huge memorable moment for you. I can tell that sticks with you. Like you said, a sliding doors moment. I'm wondering, like we always ask the people that are on the show, you've heard a couple of episodes, so you know that we asked this question about this memorable moment, like that sounds like your memorable moment. We can come back to this topic in a minute, but I'm wondering what would be a memorable moment for you as a student? Do you have any stretch back to your memories as a young person sitting in a classroom? What are some of those memorable moments too? And then we can jump back to uh, what we're talking about. Well, I've been thinking about this question, that one specifically, um, for a couple of days ever since you sent me the initial email. And you said, you know, this is one of the questions we love to ask our guests. And I think both of you guys are going to like this one because it's right up your alley in terms of the kind of things you do with, for example, ratio proportion. So and I actually talk about this story in the book, Pie of Life. When I was in eighth grade, I had this teacher, Mr. Zakowski, and, you know, he was straight out of the Wonder Years. I hope some of your listeners know what the show Wonder Years is. Um, <laughs> yeah, you guys remember. Yeah. We remember. I actually watched one of those tonight. I was talking about it with my kids, but uh, sorry, keep going. <laughs> so, you know, Mr. Zakowski, of course, cliche, if I mentioned the Wonder Years, he wanted uh, us to call him Mr. Z. So we called him Mr. Z. So one day he said, we're going to have a math contest tomorrow and there's going to be 30 questions and they're each going to be worth one point and you have 30 minutes. We don't have to use all the 30 minutes, but 30 minutes is up for you. How you're going to be scored is we're going to take the number of questions right divided by how fast you did this test. And so I went home and I was doing some mental calculations and I said, I'm just going to answer one question handed in <laughs> because, because like that's you know, let's say you get all uh, 30 questions right, it took 30 minutes. Okay, there's your ratio of one. And I figured, okay, that's going to be probably a reasonable score, probably above average. I go, how can I beat that score? And the only way I can do it is if I just choose one question. Of course, I can get zero. And I figure the first question is going to be probably the easiest or the second one, one of the two. And so, I, yeah, that was my strategy. And I actually handed the paper in. He was shocked. And we kind of argued about what, what time I said. I think I handed it in 20 seconds, right? And so I think a couple of days later, he posted the scores. And my ratio, my score was like three. I think it was like, you know, one point divided by 20 seconds or 3.33, something like that. And nobody else's ratios is in the twos. Everybody's like one point something. So he instituted a <laughs> sing rule saying that you have to finish all questions for the following years to use this contest. That's the Sunil rule. It was the Sunil rule, right? It was like, it was, if Dennis Sheeran was listening, I hope he's listening, um, you know, it's like hacking mathematics. Very cool. So wondering, like, when you were in the classroom, do you recollect any maybe successes despite, you know, we often talk about how one of the biggest challenges that teachers express to John and I and to their administrators and to different coaches and consultants is, you know, this stress of being really restrained by the curriculum. And, you know, you had referenced that curriculum 
that sterile curriculum was kind of like one of the main reasons why you actually left the teaching field. But I'm wondering within those restraints, like, do you have any maybe successes back from when you were teaching, like some memorable moment as a teacher there? And how were you able to do it under those conditions? You know, a lot of people would think that uh, my quitting sort of punctuated a frustrating teaching career. It's quite the opposite. It was a very happy career up until the very end. And there was a lot of successes. I taught at Toronto's Regent Park, which is a, you know, it's a very socioeconomically challenging kind of part of the city. And I chose to teach in that school because I taught in such good schools. I taught gifted kids. And in that school, some kids came only like once or twice a week, and that was their victory. And too often we honor kids on a roll. What about kids who just maybe show up? Maybe that's their honor roll because of stuff that's going on at home. So in this school, I remember I gave these kids these logic maze problems. They're from these books. I don't, they're out of print. I even know how I found these logic mazes. What I found about them was that they took a lot of patience and they developed resilience. It was very visual. So I gave them to one of my classes uh, when I was teaching at East Hill Collegiate, this school I just talked about in Regent Park. And there was like eight kids in the class and they're all quiet. They're quietly working on this maze. And for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, they haven't found quote unquote success. And the principal comes by and he wants to talk to me, but he goes, oh, I'll come back some other time. There's a test. I go, that's not a test. And he was like looking at me, he goes, what are they doing? I goes, they're they're doing, they're working. He was going, what are they actually doing? I go, oh, they're doing this logic maze. It, you know, tests logic decisions at a visual maze and they're all doing it. And he goes, that's amazing. And yeah, especially since half the kids probably didn't have breakfast. Half the kids have all these other issues at home. So seeing mathematics as a refuge, as a place where kids could find some peace, that was huge. And that's those four, I think five years, sorry, East Hill Collegiate. I'm so grateful that I, it was exhausting emotionally to work in that environment, but it completely made me who I am as a teacher and as a person. I want to dive into a little bit about your book, which, uh, as I said, I've been reading and have read already once. You know, you have a quote from the book that highly resonates with us. And I'm just going to read a quote here and I'm going to ask you just a little bit about it. But it said, uh, math needs to be messy, noisy and confusing. It needs to be like the crazy kitchen in a restaurant where dishes are prepared with trial and error, mistakes, challenges, and hopefully lots of fun. The nice plated meal that comes to your table is just the final part of the journey of this dish. You know, I felt like so much of our teaching is this final plate that gets delivered to the students. Like I know for me, that was all of the teaching. Like It always was just the final plate. I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more about this and how it reflects your math education beliefs. I'd love to just dive into this with you. Yeah, that one, it's a universal philosophy. When I mean universal, I use it with my kids too. So it's not something I just use in the classroom or something for professional development. You know, it's like I walk the walk all the time with that. I don't take shortcuts. And, you know, I'll give you an example of just being messy. So my daughter, who's in grade five, you know, both my kids learn their prime numbers by playing Dan Finkel's prime climb game. My daughter, she knows her primes up to 223. It's because she wants to know them. So one of the things that she was doing just uh, actually uh, today, because we had a snow day. So I asked her to break up numbers from one to 60 if they weren't primes into their composites. And she knows what composites means. It's sometimes we coddle kids and I find the kids who are elementary, they love to learn new words, new language. It makes them feel like, you know, like they're, really doing something important. So when she got to 42, a lot of times we there's this big thing about learning math facts. Of course, we should learn math facts. Six times seven is 42. But what's more important is that if you know that 42 is two times three times seven, and the reason I say that, because then she started building her own math facts from that. I said, Ray, I picked two other numbers here. And so she picked a two and seven. I go, what's two times seven? She goes, 14. What's left? Three. Well, guess what? 14 times three is 42. I know to you and I, that might not seem, but I looked at her pupils. I mean, she thought that was so cool that all these other multiplications were coming out of 42 by playing around with it. And it took a while for her to keep breaking down, breaking down. But again, all these little things that we do, and, you know, Joe Bowler talks about a lot about math flexibility and all these things. We're trying to create these flexible thinkers, and you cannot create flexible thinking unless you're given a safe space to be messy and have fun and take your time to play around with numbers. 
it so reminds me of just this idea of oftentimes we have this impression like kids need to know certain things before they can engage in interesting math problems. And basically what you're highlighting for us is that it's actually quite the opposite. It's we could do all kinds of like really interesting and sometimes very challenging things in math class, but really it's all in how we offer it up to students, right? And to our children, it's about curiosity. It's about asking interesting questions. And guess what? If they don't know, they don't necessarily, like you don't have to tell them, are they ready to be told? Is it like, are they at that point where maybe the frustration's taken over and they're ready for you to kind of help them along? Or is it something that you let them just sit on and simmer in their minds a little bit? It reminds me of something, I believe it's Lucy West, who talks about language and talks about vocabulary. And, you know, oftentimes you reference this idea of like when students are learning new vocabulary, new ideas, sometimes when it's more complex, they actually feel like that they're doing something important. And just like you said, we often worry about using certain language in math class because we don't want to scare kids or, you know, we don't want to overwhelm them. And I think, again, it's just how we use it. And there's little kids, and this is where Lucy West comes in. I believe it was her who said, there's little kids in kindergarten who can say triceratops. You know, like they can say all kinds of big words. They think it's cool. They like it. They want to talk using big words, but they want to make sure that they know what it means. And, you know, they want to do it at their own pace and because they're interested in it. So finding ways to ask kids interesting questions and get them curious about it, I think is so important. And and leaving the room for that messy, noisy, confusing, like you had mentioned in your quote, I think is so important. Well, you know, you just said so much there. I was listening to the first part where you said, how do we offer mathematics to kids? It's like you only get first chance to make a first impression. So, you know, we're making many first impressions in math every time we roll out a new topic or a new idea. I think long and hard, as I'm sure both of you do and all of the teachers, about every kind of even small detail. And, you know, with elementary kids, again, I think we're doing it completely backwards. I went to my daughter's first grade class, and this was a sort of a TSN I'm saying TSN as though everyone will know TSN, uh, the sports network. It was called the TSN Turning Point. Uh, it was a turning point in my career because I realized that these elementary kids, they can get the answer wrong 19 times in a row, their hand's still up. They don't care. And they're still smiling with whatever right. teeth they have. Maybe they're starting to lose their baby teeth. It's so adorable, but there's so much to be tapped into here because here's a chance maybe where we can introduce probably topics which we might not have thought are you know, they should save for later. No, no, I've, kids can actually handle quite a bit. And, you know, they're not jaded by things like grades and other things which might be going on as they develop emotionally and psychologically as children. I taught number theory to first grade kids. The, when my daughter said, can you come to my class? And I said, sure. And the night before, I'm getting these sort of cold sweats because I'm thinking I'm a high school math and physics teacher. What am I going to talk to first grade kids about, right? I mean, they can probably count to 10. I don't know what else they can do. And I was naive. And I went in, I started to do some number theory. And what I mean by that, I'll give you, this is the sort of the example I do every time I do a workshop to illustrate the potential that our kids have and the potential of math can do transform a classroom. So I got those Cuba links and uh, I built the number six. And I wanted to make sure that kids could see that this was six I was holding up. So I counted with them one, two, three, four, five, six. And then I quote unquote my testers. And these testers, I first one I was testing was the number one, does one go into six? I didn't use things like divisors or factors. And the kids could visually see, yeah, it seems like one is going evenly into six. I tried two and two goes into six and they count along with me, one, two, three. We didn't say three times two, but these kids are saying two times three, three times two subconsciously. And then I tested three and sure enough, and some kids were saying, oh, you shouldn't pick up the four because it's not going to work. So then I took the numbers one, two, and three, the blocks, and it was the same height as six. And I said, six, perfect number. Would you like to find another perfect number under 30? And I did a couple more to show them that eight was too short. One, two, and four only adds up to seven. So it's a little shorter than eight. I showed that 12, one, two, three, four, six is too high. So making like the story of the three bears. So then I poured a whole bunch of blocks, 50 to 100 blocks in a group of table. And after 20 minutes, I kid you not, to me, it's still, still one of my favorite moments I should have said as a teacher, even though I was in my daughter's classroom. A group of five girls had built a tower of 28 and they had their testers one, two, four, seven, fourteen 14 right beside them. And 
I said, would you like to build another perfect number? And the kids are jumping up and down. I go, well, sorry, we don't have enough blocks because the next perfect number is 496. And their eyes are popping out. And I go, okay, you want to see what the next one is? And they're, they're screaming, yes. I go, it's 8,128. And the next one's 33 million. So it's this curiosity of large numbers, the lore of things which are beyond them. You know, we're trying to create a lifetime interest in mathematics. And what's the best place to start? Kindergarten, grade one. And it's like, you know, kids have this natural curiosity, right? And I say kids, and the reason I say kids is because I truly believe that all humans are naturally curious, but it's sort of sucked out of us along the way. And I mentioned it before on the podcast. I say it a lot when I'm leading workshops and so on. And something for me that I realized that has really shifted my practice around how I teach is this idea. And it's a quote from the book called A Coaching Habit or The Coaching Habit. And in that book, they say, stay curious a little bit longer and hold off on action and advice giving just a little bit longer. It's this idea that if we can just hang on into that land of curious of like asking kids questions, we can avoid, first of all, overwhelming, turning them off, rushing, you know, to get to the next thing and really trying to meet students where they are. And that kind of leads us into another quote that we had pulled out from your book that really jumped out at us is you had said that obvious might be the most dangerous word used in teaching and learning mathematics. Like, what did you mean by that? And for me, I feel like it's so easy for us to teach as if everything's obvious, you know, everything before today is so obvious and I'm just going to kind of keep on going. What does that mean to you and how might teachers be able to use that as a tool to be a more effective teacher? For me, the word obvious, the reason why sort of this caveat is not only because of just how a lot of kids and even teachers might not see something right away. It's this word in our system that it's this closure. It indicates of this velocity of trying to learn that we're trying to get to that. Come on, isn't it obvious? That's the last word I want to say. I mean, even if I write one plus one equals two and okay, that's obvious, I really want to delay that word. I want people to question, you know, Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead, you know, write this, wrote this 200 page book on the proof of one plus one equals two. I think we have some time to pause and think about what's true or not. So I think the idea of obvious to me is like a, it's like the end of the movie. It's like, oh no, I want to keep going. Come on, there's got to be some more questions. Can I really do this? Can I say that? Are you sure? And there's a really great quote. I got forgot it. It's by I think Carlo Rovelli, the Italian physicist. And you know, he says, beyond all things, you know, it's important to maintain a sense of doubt. And doubt is it's a very positive idea in mathematics because you're not harnessed, you're not tethered to being correct. That doesn't interest you as much. You know, it's more the journey, the questions, everything else. I mean, this whole, everything we've said so far is all tied together. But yeah, the word obvious to me is like this sort of rush to close the lesson or idea. Yeah, like when you brought up that idea of doubt, it reminded me of uh, when we were talking with James Tanton and he was talking, you know, about one of his memorable moments from math class was his teacher was talking and introducing the Pythagorean theorem. And they had said, for these three cases, it works. And, you know, and when he was a student, he was thinking, okay, well, it works for 111 different cases, but what about the 112th? You know, he wanted the proof. Uh, How do you know for sure? He wanted the proof. Yeah. And I... And I think he even put that in the foreword of your book, that example, now that I say it out loud. But uh, yeah, I think that the whole idea of obvious is something that I definitely, you know, I think people who listen to the podcast know that I was a very traditional math teacher for a very long time. And I remember thinking that kids should, you know, it's obvious that they should know this. And, you know, the other thing that I did that I always look back on with a little regret is I used to definitely say on the first week of class, these words like, you should know this from last year or coming into class, you should know this. And they never did. And, <laughs> or they looked at you like they'd never seen it before. But I've definitely changed. Or like, what would I do as a student? Yeah. What would I do if I didn't know it now that you've said it? Like, does that actually help me as a student? Right. No, yeah, right? It doesn't it do me maybe lose sleep. All it, yeah, <laughs> all it does is just make them feel bad about their history uh, in math class. And they're like, here we go again in math class that I feel like the idiot that I'm supposed to know things and I just don't when things didn't sink in for a reason in their previous years. So, you know, obvious is a very scary word for us. You also use another word in the book to describe math and you use simple. And you said, unfortunately, no word could be further from the truth when most 
people describe mathematics, which is sadly ironic because no word could be closer to the truth when describing math. And I think you elaborate on that in the book a little bit. And it resonated with me about that story you told about how you showed students the sum of the odd integers is a perfect square number. I wonder if you could share that a little bit with us and talk about simple and simplicity in math. Well, one of the things actually, uh, when I was thinking about simple, and I didn't talk about it in the book, but I'll talk about it here. When I taught trigonometry, uh, right angle trigonometry with my kids, uh, probably the last five, six years of my teaching, they didn't use a trig table or a calculator. So what we did was, and this, again, the reason why I did that, not only because you can, but I wanted them to have a moment to realize what else can I do by really trying to understand something which sometimes gets bogged down in sort of, you know, Sakato and stuff like that. So for example, when my kids are doing, I don't know, let's say you have to find the angle. So tan theta equals 2.7. And so, you know, the kids, of course, make sure is, is my calculator in second function? How do you do inverse? I don't know. Like they're asking all these questions and I used to get frustrated. I go, okay, it's slow a black down. box. Yeah. <laughs> what I would tell kids is, okay, we're dealing with right angles. They go, yes. So what I want you to do is I just want you to everyone draw a base. So everyone's drawing a different base. Okay, stop. Stop drawing your base now. And now we're going to focus on number 2.7. What I want you to do is I want you to draw the other leg, the vertical leg. So it's roughly, I don't know, 2.7, 2.8, 3, I don't know, three times as big. Okay, everyone's going to try to eyeball 2.7. And now I want you to connect those two legs and that's going to be the hypotenuse. I want everyone to look at that angle. Take a shot at it. What do you think it is? Almost all the classes was within three, four degrees of the actual answer. And the same thing when I would go like, okay, sine theta, 30 degrees, it's 0.5. Well, that's because anytime you make a triangle, 90, 90 degree triangle, which has a 30 degree angle, the opposite side is always 50% the length of the hypotenuse every single time. That's what that ratio means. And so kids would actually love the fact of how close they would be able to do these questions of estimating the angle or estimating the side, given some information, because now they understood ratio proportion in terms of what those numbers meant. And then they would say, oh, this is so simple. I go, exactly. And that's something that only in the recent years did that even dawn on me. It was early in my career when I was teaching grade 10, where trigonometry was a big focus in the grade 10 courses I was teaching. And back then, I was pretty fresh out of teacher's college and really having never been taught how trigonometry actually like where it came i would say where it came from like the conceptual like why it works like i was taught a good nice fill of procedures or maybe the teacher i don't want to sell any teachers out maybe they tried to teach me conceptually but it just never worked for me or you know it never resonated for me and i could do you know the sokotoa and i could fire it into my calculator i could do all of those things and get answers but never actually having an understanding of, you know, the actual proportional relationship between those sides in every right angle triangle, you know, depending on those angles, you know, like all that mattered was that those triangles were similar. And, you know, these are things now that I go, oh man, I want to go back and teach grade 10 again, because we could have so much fun with it. I never liked teaching trig because there wasn't really anything interesting about it in the way I was teaching it, which kind of brings us back to this idea about that final plate that you referenced in the book. And we often give them that final plate of like, here's, you know, and I think James even mentioned it. It's like, there's mathematicians who spend so much of their life trying to unpack a process. And I think his example was long division, for example, where, you know, we just give it to them as this already nice and clear cut final list of steps and procedures, but yet it took years and years and years for mathematicians to come up with this very cut down, trimmed fat version of division. So when we're thinking about this, and if we want to move away from just teaching this final plate, but we're in this environment with sometimes maybe that sterile curriculum, as you've referenced, this is something that teachers are always asking us, like, what sort of advice might you be able to give them in order to help them feel like they're doing their job to cover, we like to call it uncovering the curriculum, but like to make sure that they're doing what that curriculum is asking of them, covering those standards and their constant feeling of needing more time. Like what sort of advice might you be able to give them to offer them some sort of way to maybe feel a little bit more balance in that regard? 
Yeah, that's sometimes it's like squaring a circle. It, it seems like an almost impossible task. And the one thing I can say about that, because part of that was when we finished writing the book, we were asked to really stretch ourselves in terms of the maybe the first year teacher, elementary teacher who's not is math their first subject and make sure you're really explicit about everything that you say, why you're playing this game and all these things. I would say the first step in a teacher dealing with curriculum and making sure they're meeting all the standards, uh, it sounds like something which is not related, but it is, is to be honest with your students. So for example, what I mean by that is if kids ask you a question, you either give them the answer or you say, I don't know. And you get used to saying, I don't know, because it takes the burden off of you know, being correct. And, you know, then students see that and they go, wow, it's, I, I'm, this classroom is disarmed. And releasing all that pressure, now you probably have more time to look at the topics that you feel that you you need to rush through because there isn't this pressure to, as Dan Finkel said in his third bullet point in his TED Talk, you know, you're not the answer key. Your job is to want to find the answer with your students. So to me, that is the most important quality of a math teacher is this desire to find the answer. And once I think that kind of state is set in a classroom and being honest, like I used to be honest all the time. I mean, in high school, maybe I can get away with it. I used to tell kids what my favorite topics were in math. Like I love number theory. You know, I love this. And, you know, when we we're going through certain parts of the curriculum, I'd say, oh, okay, just bear with me. This was not my favorite topic in school either, <laughs> right? So it's like they trust you. They're going to go the extra mile for you because when you start getting really jacked up on your favorite topic, they go, yeah, I can see why it's cool. And then when you're just always playing the, you know, you're going to be using this in the future kind of stuff, there's a sort of a breaking of some trust. So establish that trust relationship with your kids. And I think a lot of things in the curriculum are going to flow a lot easier. This is very interesting. Like, can you bring up like qualities of a math teacher? Just this question just popped into my mind and is that what other qualities would you see as so important for a math teacher and feel free to like, you know, we're putting you on the spot here, but feel free to like the, the whole gamut of probably qualities of people. But if you got a first year teacher listening right now, what would you say? Like, this is the things that you should be focusing on as these are the winners for you and your students in the classroom. Well, you know, of course, the honesty one and to really emphasize that one. But the other one, and this was it was given to me by my faculty of ed teacher, Dave Alexander, back in 1992 and you know he's still kicking around and he said to be a mutual learner and at that time you know you're in faculty of ed and it just seems like more sort of faculty ed gobbledygook and but after more than you know 25 years on especially when I'm doing math with my kids everything I'm doing I'm doing it I wanted them to think I'm doing it for the first time I'm excited about this and I truly am because I want them to you never know what topic, what idea could potentially create a lifetime interest. You just never know. And to give it your all, to be a mutual learner. And I tell my friends this all the time because, you know, kids, might, they always go, your kids must be good at math. I go, I don't know if they're good at math. I can tell you this, they love math. And being good at math doesn't necessarily nurture the love of mathematics. But if you love math, I'm sure one day you might be good at it, whatever that means. So the most important thing for me, I'd say, is if my kids had a choice between two teachers, and I can say this on air, like 100% of the time it's true, and my kids have a choice between a teacher who has a degree in mathematics a little bit of old school, well-intentioned, kind of strict, you know, worksheets, pretty standard fair stuff, but they have a degree in math versus a, a brand new teacher, first year teacher, comes from arts background, drama background. But from what I've heard is I just got the kindest soul going. I want my kids to be in that classroom because that teacher who's got that kind of kind soul probably has enough in her heart to see that I need to find out more about mathematics. And there'd be nothing wrong with that teacher saying, is it okay if I learn third grade math with you this year? Is that okay? I'm perfectly okay with that. And, you know, even though I talk mostly about content, 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 first of all, every single teacher, whether you're a first year teacher teaching first grade or teaching high school for 25 years, everybody can learn new content. Okay? Nobody should be resting on their laurels. You know, there's something interesting to find out every single day. And I think that mutual learner thing to me is like probably the second key bullet point. 
It's interesting too, because like that's a culture you have to build in your classroom, you know, and that's just something that I think going back to that idea of staying curious kind of helps to foster that because when you're constantly asking students questions, I think they start to blur the lines between, are you asking that of me because you don't know, or do you actually know? And you're just asking me that, but like, I always find when you stay curious and if you do it in a authentic way, you know, I'm constantly saying to students, you know, now that I'm in the role I'm in, I go into these random classrooms and students don't know me. It, I don't get the opportunity to kind of build that relationship. So I go in and I'm truly just asking questions and I sort of never show my cards. And I think that can go a really long way to make them feel like there's some co-learning happening, you know, when you can make students feel like they're teaching you something along the way. And you mentioned being honest, and sometimes maybe I'm not being fully honest in that regard, <laughs> because, you know, I'm letting them teach me, but I really want to hear their strategies. And oftentimes their strategies are some different ways that I would have not thought of it. And, you know, and I am learning alongside them. So that to me is something that pops into my mind for sure. So Sunil, we've been talking a lot about your book, Pie of Life, and what a great book it is. We're wondering what other projects have you been working on lately? I know you're always keeping busy, so I thought maybe we would shift to some of what you're currently working on and what might be in store for some of the folks listening. For sure. Well, I, actually, as we speak, going through the developmental edits of Math Recess, a book I've co-written with Chris Burnell from California, the, the term Math Recess was given to me by Paul Lockhart, who I mentioned quite a bit in the first book and which many of your listeners as probably know, I had the pleasure of meeting Paul for coffee in 2017 in Brooklyn. And we actually had a 10-year email relationship. I was surprised how sort of open he was to respond back when I emailed him in 2009. And his first book was just about to be printed, A Mathematician's Lament. And I met him for coffee. And after we had our half an hour exchange, and I felt like I was at the Oracle of Delphi. I didn't want to talk. I didn't want to even answer his questions because that means I had less time to listen to him. And as we're leaving the cafe in Brooklyn, you know, gives me a nice warm hug. He says, it's almost sort of like cliche movie-like as he's walking away, he goes, remember, I get paid to provide math recess to my kids. And I go, I remember I emailed him probably that day or the day after, I can't remember. I said, Paul, can I use that? Because I think I'm going to write a book. Because when we think of recess, we think of something that you want to run to. And, you know, it's traditionally been this amazing free time of kids to invent their own rules, to socialize, to learn each other, to stumble, fall, all those wonderful things that were about free play. So what would math recess look like where you want to run to this thing and you would never want to leave? So hopefully we've written something which measures up to what I think what Paul Lockhart meant by math recess. And it's been fun co-writing, just like you guys have a lot of fun doing these interviews. It was very fun because Chris and I sort of spoke to each other in the book. And so it's coming out, uh, I think, uh, April or May. Pretty excited about that. And see, in two and a half weeks, I'm going to Austin, Texas, because I'm presenting at South by Southwest Edu. And I'm going to have this workshop called Disrupting Math Education with Punk Ideology. Oh, really? brilliant wait for that. Yeah, that sounds interesting. <laughs> Is that one happening at NCTM or NCSM or both? No, it's happening at South by Southwest uh, in right. Austin. Oh, that's right. That's right. You yeah. just, yep. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. But we are going to see you at uh, NCTM, hey, correct? You are. you are. You're going to see me at NCTM. I'm going to be there the whole week in San Diego. Um, so, you know, hopefully it's going to be more than just that sort of passing hallway. How's it going? You know, a little. No, we'll have to, uh, yeah, we'll have we're, to set gonna, something up. We, we got to sit, we got to sit down and sort of, you know, keep unpacking, keep unpacking the unpacking. <laughs> yeah. The, the Ontario crew needs to stick together, right? Exactly. Awesome. Well, listen, Sunil, this is awesome. We are so excited to bring this and share this uh, episode out with the world. We're so happy that you took the time tonight to kind of carve some time out of your schedule and share some of your thinking behind your first book and as well as your next book that's coming out. And we can't wait to connect with you again, either at NCTM or before. So we just want to tip our cap and say thank you. And hopefully we'll get you back on the show at some point in the near future. Well, this has been a blast talking to you too. I mean, the hour has gone by, like I just looked at my clock and it's like almost, you know, 1030 at the time that we're doing this interview and you guys make it so much fun. You have this nice energy synergy and, you know, the stuff that you guys are doing, um, you know, 
we're all working as this collective and going back to the idea of punk ideology that's you work as a collective but you show your individual traits and i think that's why the future of math education it's really exciting right now and we'll see you in san diego yeah thank you for saying that yeah we are excited to see you and uh, thanks again have a great night we'll talk to you soon Super. Yet again, another awesome interview on our Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. Kyle, hit us with your big takeaway from this conversation. The biggest takeaway for me was Sunil's quote from his book related to math and cooking a meal and how it's so easy for us as teachers to serve up the final plate, that being the steps, procedures, the algorithms to our students. And we can really easily skip over the messy, noisy, and confusing process of actually making that meal or in math class, making sense of the mathematics through inquiry, investigation, and exploration rather than just being told what to do or telling students what to do. When are we just serving our students the final plate and how can we intentionally plan to ensure students are given the messy, noisy, and challenging experience that is mathematics? How about you, John? What resonated with you? Those are good ones. Uh, my big takeaway was when Sunil brought up the idea of being a good at math doesn't necessarily mean you love math. And he himself was more concerned with his own children, you know, that they loved math first. That was big for him. And this is big for me because I feel the same way for my three daughters and also my students. Like for my daughters, I want them to love math before, you know, they're really good at it. I'd rather them love it than be like oh, the best at it. And I also want that for my students. You know, so much of what we've been doing with our math lessons and our online workshop we put out is to make math moments for our students and moments that are worth remembering. We want our students to love math first and then be better at it second. So I think that's a big takeaway for me, Cal. Awesome, awesome. I think that's really important and it's easy for us to maybe sometimes lose sight of that, that we want students to be successful in math class. And of course we do, but at the same time, how successful can we be if there's a hurdle of maybe not enjoying it or not liking it in the way? So yeah, that's definitely a big piece for me, a big takeaway as well. So awesome stuff. How about you at home? What's your big takeaway from this episode? Share it with a friend, with a colleague, or send us a message on social media at Make Math Moments on Twitter, Instagram, and on Facebook. And in order to ensure you don't miss out on our new episodes as they come out each week, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast platform. Also, if you're liking what you're hearing, please share the podcast with a colleague and help us reach a wider audience by leaving us a review on iTunes and tweeting at Make Math Moments on Twitter. Show notes and links to resources from this episode can be found at makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 14. Again, makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 14. We release a new episode every Monday morning. Keep an eye out for our next episode, our conference companion episode. Conference season is coming up with NCTM National in San Diego and OME here in Ontario in Ottawa. This May, we'll be chatting on that particular episode about how to get the most out of attending a math conference. You know, even if you're not attending one of those conferences, the tips we share are going to be great for any PD workshop, event, or even just a meeting. Well, until next time, I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. High fives for us. And high fives for you.